So friends, uh, on behalf of Center of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing Technology at IIT Kharagpur, I'd like to welcome you all in this mega webinar series. Today is the 28th week, uh, that is September 18. You know, we have started our journey in the month of March. It is our, you know, the real uh, privilege and honor that to have so many eminent speakers uh, from different parts of this globe, from academia and also from the, the industry. We all talk about the, the industry 4.0 and we all know that the today's manufacturing is standing in the era of the industry 4.0. Industry is trying hard to make use of the digital tools so that it can have the better visibility of the process so that they can make the product smarter, cheaper and also, you know, the, the, the flexible. In order to have that, industries are thinking of developing the digital twin. So this the digital twin is nothing but the digital replica of the physical, you know, the process. So how the concept can be deployed so that the product can be visualized before it is getting, you know, the manufacturer of everything. And we are very much honored today to have Dr. Preet Banerjee amongst us as the speaker on this nice concept that digital doing challenges and opportunities in various industries. We all know Dr. Banerjee, but as a protocol, I'd like to introduce you know, him formally. Dr. Preet Banerjee is the Chief Technology Officer at ANSYS, a leader in engineering simulation. Prior to that, he was the EVP and CTO of Snyder Electronic, so Snyder Electric, Formerly, he, he was Managing Director of Global Technology R&D Center at Accenture. Earlier, he was EBP and CTO of ABP. Previously, he was Director of HP Labs. Formerly, he was Dean of Engineering at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He was also the Chairman of EC at Northwestern and the Professor of EC at the University of Illinois. In 2000, he founded Accenture which was sold to Zilinx in 2006. During 2005 to 2011, he was the founder, chairman, at, and chief scientist of Bina Chief. Banerjee currently serves on the board of directors of Tarandai Technologies. In the past, he has served on board of Cray, Cubic, and Anita Ball Institute, and the technical advisory boards of Ambit, Attenta, Calypto, Cypress, Ingram, Ingram Micro, and Vise. He was listed in the first company list of 100 top business leaders in 2009. He's a fellow of AAAS, ACM, and IT. He received his BTEC in electronics engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. He is also the, you know, the PGM President Gold Medal Award. And he has earned his MS and PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois, Arona. With this, uh, I request Dr. Banerjee to start his presentation. Dr. Banerjee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, so it is an absolute pleasure and honor to, to come back and, and talk to you. Uh, I hope, let me see, let me make sure that you can see my presentation. Let me share it again. Yeah. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? It's coming up, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. So, so as uh, Professor Paul said, I am Chief Technology Officer at ANSYS, and I'm going to talk about this idea of digital twins, it's a very, very exciting area. Lots of opportunities. It's a $26 billion market, but there are lots of challenges. And because this is an academic uh, audience, I will share some of the challenges that are involved. But if we can solve those problems, that the opportunities are, are enormous. But before I, uh, I, I, so what I'm going to talk about is a very quick introduction to ANSYS. Some of you may know of ANSYS, but others may not. So I'll sh share that with you. And as CTO at ANSYS, I'm responsible for 
for creating our long-term technology strategies. So I'll give you a quick overview of that. And one of the pillars of the long-term strategy is digital twins. And so I'll go deeper into, into that topic. Uh, I know that Professor Paul has written a, a book recently on digital twins, uh, you know, which is an amazing uh, accomplishment, but I will provide you some of the sort of example use cases where digital twins can be used in manufacturing other areas and sort of the role of physics simulation in digital twins. But what we have found out, so if there is one, one message that I want to uh, leave you with is that to really develop accurate digital twins, you cannot do it with pure data analytics. You cannot do it with pure physics. You have to do combine the physics and data analytics in what is called hybrid digital twins. This is where, what the future is. And so I'm gonna talk about that approach that we have built at, at ANSYS and it is resonating with lots and lots of customers and partners. And then I will end with talking about some of the open ecosystems. We are part of the Digital Twin Consortium and other places. And again, they are constantly looking for academic partners. So I urge you to consider membership of the Digital Twin Consortium. So that's sort of the, the agenda. What I want to start with is an introduction to ANSYS. So ANSYS is today the leader in engineering simulation. And we are a, we, we are a 50 year old company. We have about $2 billion in revenue. We have about 5,000 uh, employees, about 2,000 of them are part of the research and development organization, uh, which is sort of the portfolio that I own at, at, at ANSYS. And so the world around us is governed by the laws of physics, right? So at the bottom, you see different physics-based simulations, so structural simulation or fluid simulation, electro electronic simulation. So let's look at a structure like a bridge. You look at a bridge structure, you have certain amount of weight that you are, and you are applying some, some initial conditions, boundary conditions through ANSYS simulation using finite element analysis. You can solve those second order partial differential equations using numerical methods, and you can very, very accurately come up with an answer. Same thing for fluid simulations. You have a fluid flow over an airfoil in an airplane, and you can solve those Navier-Stokes equations, second order partial differential equations, very, very accurately using finite volume methods. Or in electromagnetics, you have second order partial differential equations called Maxwell's equations, and you solve them again using finite element analysis. So we started with structures 50 years ago, then we acquired a company called Fluent, which is the leading fluid simulation a technology. Then we acquired a company called Ansoft, which is the leading electromagnetic simulation. And over the years, we have got a lot of physics capabilities in all kinds of physics areas. In the past, our customers used to be involved with single physics, either structural simulation or fluids. But the world around us is actually multi-physics interactions. So today we provide the capability of all kinds of fluid structure interactions or fluid structure electromagnetics interactions. For example, you have a, an antenna, right? Sitting on top of a law, big structure and you may have a cyclone in, in near uh, Calcutta, right? And that because of the wind, right? Which you can model through fluids, you can model the fluid flow. And then because of it, the structure moves right or left. You can model that through structures. And because of the movement, the antenna structure, right? Instead of being a circle, maybe become an oval and we can actually measure simulate how much bandwidth will come out of that antenna. What is the latency of the signal? We can do it very, 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 very accurately. So the challenge in simulation is to be accurate. Simultaneously, it has to be fast, right? So you can make it, make a simulation go fast by using lower sort of number of mesh points, right? Instead of having a hundred mesh points, if you can do a thousand mesh points or a million mesh points, it becomes very accurate. But in order to do accuracy, you really lose in the speed. So what we are trying to do is always coming up with the most accurate, fastest, most robust, and sort of easy to use workflow. That's sort of what we have been doing over the last 50 years. One of the other things we have done is to take in different materials properties, right? So as you look at a structural uh, uh, part like steel, you have the Young's modulus of steel, which tells you if you apply this much pressure, 
how much will it bend, right? What is the tensile strength, right? And and so we in the past materials properties used to be programmed into the the solvers. Nowadays you have, we have this grant uh, materials platform that has access to hundred thousand different materials, and those materials properties go into the structures. So the world is going towards the field of what is called ICME, integrated computational materials engineering, where we are modeling sort of atoms all the way to structures and so on. Then last year, we acquired a company called AGI, which provides us what is called digital missions engineering. So you can model entire missions of airplanes and ships and, and satellites and, and, uh, and, and different units, right, at a system level. And so essentially what we have at ANSYS is simulating atoms to rocket ships. That's sort of the vision that we have. And we have taken our set of solutions to solve problems in aerospace and defense and automotive, energy and healthcare. We have more than 45,000 customers using ANSYS tools. Now, as CTO at ANSYS, I am responsible for developing our long-term technology strategy uh, with these sort of 2,000 R&D engineers that we have. And we have partitioned, we have looked at it in terms of the core technology that we are looking at. One of the technologies is numerical methods, right? Simulation is at the core of our, our, uh, our technology approach, right? And but there are many, many numerical methods, right? There are direct methods, iterative methods, finite element methods, finite volume methods. So the center of excellence at ANSYS on numerical methods is looking at the future technologies, right? Implicit methods, explicit methods, combined methods and so on. The next area is that of meshing and geometry where to solve these numerical solutions, right? You have to really look at conformal meshing, non-conformal meshing, morphing technology and so on. Then the output of a simulation is normally visualized on a 2D screen. In the future, we are looking at the use of augmented reality, 3D viewing and so on, right? Uh, I mentioned the fact that our, our technologies involves, you can go from single physics to multi-physics to multi-domain, multi-scale simulation. So we, we are working on this platform technology called ANEED, which is allowing us to solve all these different uh, physics in a multi-physics, multi-domain manner. The central part is talking about some of the work that we are doing in AI machine learning that is actually done in the, in the city office, where, where we are using AI ML methods to accelerate simulation called augmented simulation. We are using data-driven methods, physics inform methods, ML methods, and so on. Again, in a future time, I may give you a deep dive talk on AI machine learning applied to simulation. And as I said, the challenges of simulation are to look at high performance compute, I mean, sort of speed and accuracy. And if you want to do really accurate simulation, these solvers oftentimes take 10,000 hours to run. So we are using high performance computing, parallel computing, speed things up, using shared memory multiprocessing, uh, message passing, GPUs, and so on. And all of these HPC can be on premise or on the cloud. So we are looking at various things for cloud first designs, anything as a service and so on. In the world of, of product innovation, in the automotive area or aerospace area, people talk about concepts of model based systems engineering, virtual verification validation. So there's a lot of work that we do in this area. Then we have work on integrated computational materials engineering, ICME and additive manufacturing. We are working on a lot of solutions in autonomy, electrification, and so on. And one of the solutions I am personally driving in, uh, in the city office is healthcare. Healthcare is a new vertical, how simulation can be used to essentially do clinical trials for new drug discovery or for new uh, medical devices like pacemakers and so on. But the 12th vertical is that of digital twins, which is what I'm highlighting here. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, the exciting area of digital twins. So what is the digital twin, right? So basically, again, I, I know, I mean, Professor Paul, you, your center has written a book on digital twin, but I just wanted to kind of set the, uh, the definition correct, right? So we are members of a digital twin consortium. We are the founding members, we, along with, with eight other companies like Microsoft and GE and so on. And this uh, uh, consortium, where I'm the steering committee member of, has come up with this formal definition. A digital twin is a virtual representation of real world entities and processes that are synchronized at a specific frequency and fidelity. It's a short definition, but it actually means a lot of stuff, right? So essentially what a digital twin is, it's a connected virtual replica 
of an in-service physical asset, right? So oftentimes people consider you know, sort of confuse the digital twin what is simulation model. What makes it a digital twin is you have a simulation model, but it has to be synchronized, right? With some sensors connected to the asset that collects the data. And uh, as you collect data from the physical asset, the real world, you make your model more accurate, right? And so the digital twin is constantly being more accurate, always synchronized with the physical asset. So the purpose of this is you track the past, you provide deeper insights on the present and predict the future. If you can do that really accurately, it has have tremendous implications in all industries, such as increasing revenue, reducing cost, and essentially gaining competitive edges. So digital twins have been used in various industries, right? I, I know that this particular uh, talk is on manufacturing, but it has been used in aerospace, like GE and NASA were the first users of digital twins many, many, many years ago, uh, where they took an aircraft engine, put some sensors on the engine, and they were able to predict exactly when that engine will require maintenance. Same thing happening in the automotive industry. People are using it for doing predictive maintenance of of, of brakes and engines and tires. In manufacturing, people are using it in manufacturing lines, uh, improving what is called the overall equipment efficiency, OEE metric. They are doing it in buildings and infrastructure, in oil and gas. In, I was just in a meeting yesterday with Shell where they're using digital twins for, uh, for essentially predicting uh, sort of a, a, of a digital oil well, right? So tremendous amount of opportunity in various industries. Now, in each of these industries, right, so there is sort of a concept of a digital twin at different phases. There is a digital twin in a design phase. So let's uh, pick that example of that aircraft engine, right? So you design that aircraft engine using a CAD tool, right? We're like Autodesk or PTC Cree or so on, right? That's an as-designed asset, right? So you, it's, the, it's a perfect CAD tool. It's a perfect geometry, perfect rectangles and circles and so on as you have in a CAD tool and assuming ideal materials, right? So if it's steel, it's the young modular steel is whatever it's supposed to be. Then you take that design of an aircraft engine, right? And you manufacture the engine. So GE makes those engines. They make 100 different engines. Each engine is slightly different from the original design, right? Because you may draw it as a CAD tool, as a perfect rectangle, but when you manufacture it with injection molding or, or plastics or 3D printing or so on, the, those rectangles will not be pure rectangles. So there's some manufacturing variation and there'll be some materials variation, right? Because the steel will not be exactly the steel. So then you essentially do a, a digital twin as designed and as manufactured. Then once it is in operation, this plane, this jet engine is flying on a plane, on an Air India plane, right? After 20 years, it goes through various bird strikes and so on, right? So you have a digital twin in operations, right? And essentially, you may have an ideal pump, an ideal engine or whatever, but after 20 years, the pump or engine or compressor has different characteristics, and you need to have a digital twin of that asset in operation. And so this is the opportunity of digital twins, right, in design, in manufacturing, and in operations. So the market, I kind of talked about the opportunities, right? The opportunities of digital twins is huge. It's a $26 billion market by 2025, right? And there are people are looking at different sort of design phase is 5.6 billion, process phase is 7.3 billion. So if you can crack this problem, right, the, the economic benefits are huge. And in all industries, I kind of mentioned digital twins in different industries, manufacturing, agriculture, and so on, right? It is showing that today in manufacturing, right, just the percentage of, uh, of the overall business is about 20, 20%. In the future, it'll be 15, but 15% of a 26 billion, which is a huge thing. So as your uh, advanced uh, manufacturing center at IIT Kharagpur is working on, on various technologies and digital twins, if you can solve it well, it is going to have huge implications. And I was talking to some, some companies in India uh, just last week, Mahindra, Mahindra and, and, and Tata Motors and so on, and they are looking at digital twins as well, right? So this would be a very, very exciting opportunity if you can solve all the challenges, which is where I will get to now. So now that now that I've given the sort of the business motivation for digital twins, let me talk about the actual uh, sort of technology, right? 
So I will talk about the role of physics-based simulation digital twins, right? But I will first start with data analytics. So I mentioned that digital twins, the way it's done is you take a physical asset like an aircraft engine or a, or a motor or a pump or a valve, right? And you stick some sensors on that, right? And, and essentially you collect data on the sensors, right? And on a, using an IoT platform, for example, ABB, when I was at ABB, we had this platform called Ability, right? Or when I was at Schneider Electric, we had a platform called EchoStructure. When I was, people at G, they have this thing called Critics Platform. So essentially, any of these companies having lots of assets, they'll connect the assets to a sensor, connect to an IoT platform, and they gather data, right? Based on that data that you pr provide, you build these sort of neural network model. This is how, how uh, people build this uh, sort of data-driven modeling for digital twins, right? The advantage of this approach, and this is why 90% of the people use this approach, is you don't need to know the physics of the assets, right? Relatively easy to build, right? It's a totally general approach. The disadvantage is it requires lots and lots of training data, right? So a particular engine can fail in many different ways, right? Unless you have trained the model on that particular failure mode, you will never be able to predict it. For example, right, I give this as an example. When the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, right, there was an accident that happened 10 years ago, right? No amount of digital twinning model would have predicted that failure because that particular explosion accident happened only once. But if you had physics-based models, you can actually model the actual explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger, right? When the Challenger had a tile that got removed, you could model through simulation that the space shuttle is going through atmosphere. There's a lot of heat that is being generated, right? Because of the heat, this thing will, structure will start collapsing and will crack. You could actually model it through simulation, but you cannot model it through, through uh, data analytics, which motivates the need for physics-based digital twins, right? Which is where Cervantes comes in. So the physics-based model says, if you can physically simulate how an asset would behave, would fail, right, using all the mechanical models, the fluids models, and electronics models. So let me give, give you an example, right? I live in San Francisco with this beautiful Golden Gate Bridge, right? Let's imagine you have this bridge that I'm showing on the right-hand side. Now, if you observe a crack in the bridge tower that is 12 inches long today, right? Today is September 18th. You go in and somebody measures the, the, the crack and you measure it through a sensor and IoT platform. Now, looking at all the sort of bridges in the world, right? You can do a predictive analysis saying that after uh, one week, this 12 inch crack will become 18 inches. That is how you would normally do that prediction. But what you can do in this case is you can actually run say ANSYS simulation, right? It's a structural simulation say, well, if there is a thousand cars that are driving, you predict the crack propagation to be exactly 18 inches, right? You do it through physics. But then you actually measure the crack next week to be 60 inches. Then you update the simulation model to slow down the crack propagation instead of going to 18 inches. Oh, no, I'm, I, I should slow it down, right? So essentially, this is how the physics-based simulation in sort of a, in partnership with actual measurement data analytics, right? You are calibrating it. You make that model accurate. So this is where ANSYS is headed, right, in terms of this physics-based approaches. So what you have to do in terms of building a digital twin is right, you have to have those assets and infrastructure, right? Be it in, in an automotive industry or aerospace or manufacturing, right? In a manufacturing line, you have lots of machines like uh, injection molding machines or energy manufacturing machine. You take those assets, you connect sensors, you connect it to an IoT platform. Then you build a database analytics using either PTCs, ThingWorks or Microsoft Azure uh, platforms and so on. But on top of it, what we are building is this simulation-based or hybrid analytics. So using simulation, what happens is the value of this digital twin is the following, right? You can create virtual sensors when you have missing data. So let's imagine that you have uh, 1,000 pumps and compressors in a flow network, right? Now, you could potentially, if you could put a sensor in every one of the pumps, every one of the compressors and so on, we can obviously get a very, very accurate simulation uh, analysis. But it, there are cases where inside a, a pump, for example, there is cavitation that happens in a pump. 
you actually cannot put a sensor inside the, 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 the compressor because if you put it, it will not act as a pump or a compressor, right? So you have to create a virtual sensor by measuring things on the outside. So when, because of the laws of physics, right? You can say, if I did this, this is going to happen, right? So essentially you can fake it as if there was a sensor in there, right? So based on other sensor measurements, suppose you have thousand locations, you measure the sensors at say maybe 900 locations, you can predict what the sensor output would be at this hundredth location. Or you can do what if scenarios, right? I mean, you have a car going on top of Golden Gate Bridge at 9 a.m. in the morning when it's sunny, you want to perform an analysis. What happens if it is 9 p.m. at night and it's snowing and there's ice and, and a thunderstorm in, in, in San Francisco, right? So you could do all these what if scenarios with this kind of digital twins. So now let me kind of talk about one uh, very, very important a a area, right? So you, so at ANSYS, what we do is we can do these physics-based simulations, right? To do really accurate analysis. The trouble with these physics-based models, it takes a long time. So a very important technology area is to automatically build what is called reduced order models from detailed 3D simulations. So you have the detailed 3D simulation, you have a structural model, like all these uh, pictures that I'm showing on the right-hand side, right? You're using Navier-Stokes equations to model fluids or Euler equations to model structures or Maxwell's equations. And if you have like a million mesh points, it would take you 10,000 hours to run. So your simulation would not be synchronized with that actual reality. I, I gave you the example of the bridge. I have the crack on the bridge, right? I'm predicting the crack to be 18 inches, right? Now, unless you can predict it within a week, the simulation is of no use. So therefore you need to have these reduced order models, which has to be very accurate. So what we have got at ANSYS is a slew of reduced order models. There's a linear ROM technology that we have. Again, there's subsets like state space ROMs, LTI ROMs and so on. We have nonlinear ROMs that are static, meaning it is time independent, right? So Twin Builder has this static ROM builder. And the more complicated, most general is, general is nonlinear dynamic ROMs, right? And this is what, what we use in our, in our ANSYS ROM, uh, Twin Builder. So now the technology for Twin Builder is basically you take this these different assets and you create a ROM and, and that model is what is the model of the digital twin, right? And this model you deploy, that's the twin deployer, you model as a, as a model. So now let me tell you the sort of structure of, of digital twins for Twin Builder, right? We have a model which is built using all the 3D ROM technology that we have. We validate that it is really accurate and then we deploy it on an IoT platform. This is how the sort of Twin Builder technology from ANSYS is built. So now let me give you uh, the, the actual challenges of physics-based and database uh, analytics because this is the real technical challenge. So let's imagine you have an asset, let's say, a, say a, 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 this particular say engine or whatever, a, a gas turbine, right? You are trying to model that. So the rest of the world, right? The 80% of the people use database analytics, right? Using all these neural networks and so on that I'm sure you have learned in, 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 in colleges or IITs and so on, right? You take different inputs, you build this multi-layer convolutional neural network, and based on it, you do all the analytics and say, this is, you predict, this is how the failure will happen, right? The trouble with this approach is, as I said, <clears throat> insufficient accuracy, and it's only limited to observed data, right? The training data, the example of the space shuttle challenge that I gave you. The physics-based simulation, right? Which is what uh, I just talked about for ANSYS, right? You can do all those things, it is very, very accurate. The trouble is it takes a long time, right? It's very expensive. Even if you use reduced order models, it does take a long time to run and so, right? So either of those approaches by themselves is not good enough. So let me give you the, the context of where the world is today in terms of digital twins, right? So most of these digital twins are being built by the industrial incumbents, right? So in automation players, right? In factory automation, like, and again, you are in, in this is a manufacturing center, so I'm sure in your manufacturing facility, I have actually seen pictures of ABB robots or whatever, right, in, 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 your, in your center, right? So you have 
ABB's robots or Schneider's sort of PLCs that drives the Rockwell automations, things like so. So each of these automation players that own the assets, they're building an IoT platform and they're trying to build digital twins out of it, right? Or in the automotive industry, car companies like BMW, Mercedes or Tata or Mahindra in India, right? They're all building digital twins of their cars or engines and so on. The aerospace area, right? Boeing, Airbus, or G Rolls Royce that make the engines, or Pratt Whitney, right? Or Honeywell that make aircraft uh, electronics, right? All of them have IoT platforms and building digital twins out of it. So the people who own the assets are working on IoT platforms and building digital twins out of it. On the right hand side, you have cloud providers like AWS. I was in a meeting with with AWS and Google Cloud Platform only last week, right? Where they're building out all these sort of IoT based platforms and running things on the cloud and trying to build digital twins out of it, right? Like for example, the Azure Digital Twin. Then there are companies that are not cloud providers, but pure sort of data companies like C3.ai. Yesterday I was in a meeting with Tom Siebel at C3.ai. They are building this data analytics platform. So the people on the top left, top right and bottom right, all of these people are using data-based analytics. And there are simulation companies like ANSYS or Dassault Systems or Siemens Software, Hexagon, PTC. These people are using simulation-based digital twins. But as I showed in the previous example, right, either of these approaches is not good. So what you need is a hybrid approach which combines the two. And that's sort of what we have been doing at ANSYS led by the work in the city office. So let me so now tell you how we have combined the two. So the architecture for the digital twin that we have is shown on this picture. So you have an asset. That asset can be modeled through ANSYS Fluent, which is this fluid dynamics core, or with ANSYS Structural, ANSYS Mechanical, which is this structural core, or with, say, ANSYS Electromagnetics, which is HFSS, right? So you can start with that asset and you can build a validated ANSYS model, right? at the 3D level, which is very accurate, but perhaps takes a long time. You take those models and then you build automatically a reduced order model of this asset, including the sort of the multi-physics interaction, like a fluid structure interaction, fluid structure electromagnetics. You build that ROM model out of that, that structure, right? So you start with these CAD model of a part, you build this simulation model, you build the ROM, and based on it, you create a twin model, which you deploy. That's that sort of one zero software code that will run on either the edge or a or the cloud. Then what you do is, and, and that will have a certain amount of accuracy, right? Then you say, yeah, I'm also getting data from the cloud, right? So I do these database ROMs and I put it in and I do this hybrid model, which is sort of where we are today with, with our twin builder, right? So essentially this allows you to do calibration and aug augmentation. Now, in certain cases, like when you go into a say Shell, I was in a meeting with Shell uh, yesterday along with C3, right? They oftentimes don't have the actual assets, the CAD models of those assets, right? The pumps and, and, and compressors come out of some, some company, right? Uh, Baker Hughes, and they don't have that, right? So in that case, what you do is you take a model of that asset, right? You program that model in languages like Modelica, and or VHDL, AMS and so on. So you can either program the model from the top level using sort of high level models or from the bottom using the CAD. And this is sort of the architecture. Now I had always uh, imagined, right? So when I was at City or ABB or at Schneider Electric, I said, hey, uh, you need to combine the two, right? But I never actually had data to show, is, is it really worth it to do this? So this is sort of the technology, you know, sort of the, the 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 trying to see it's what, the so what this picture is showing is that if there are these two approaches one is pure physics based models or pure data analytics models right? and they are sort of coexisting you can actually do simulation that enhances the data right so you have simulation and you you essentially create more training data for your aml that's one way to do hybrid the other is data to enhance the simulation which is another way to do hybrid the correct way to do hybrid digital twins is to take the physics-based model and the database model and build this fusion model, the hybrid model, which is sort of the uh, approach that we are using at ANSYS. 
So to show you an example, so this again shows the flow, right? You can start with the 3D jam geometry, build this detailed 3D model, build a ROM, and then connect it with sort of database models and do the hybrid twin. Or as I said, if you don't have access to the CAD models, then you can start with an engineering spec like a flow model with for a motor or a, or a pump or whatever, write that in Modelica and essentially combine that with a hybrid. So either way, if you have the top level model, you can combine it with data or the bottom level CAD, combine it with data. The output of this is shown here, right? So for an industrial flow network, we actually partnered with FlowServe, a company that makes valves and flow networks and so on, right? And what this is showing is the actual data is here, right? The normaler approach, which is sort of the pure uh, database analytics approach is, is sort of accurate, but not quite. The pure, uh, the, 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 the ML based model is here, but the map model, this is sort of the combined model is absolutely accurate, right? So the question is how accurate? This is what is showing. So the pure data analytics is 80% accurate. Pure simulation is 90% accurate. If you combine the two, it's between 98 to 99%. This is sort of the, the result that I'm most excited about. We just submitted a paper uh, to IEEE software, uh, computer magazine that, that highlights some of these, this work. So the question is, what is the value of this, right? So the business value is, if you have a $10,000 part, right? And it's 80% accurate, that means 20% of the time you are making an error, right? So you have a $10,000 part, you have a 20% error, you will replace a part when you did not have to replace a part, right? So there was a $2,000 waste. If you had 90% accuracy, the cost, the waste would go down to $200. That's the end value to the customer. So hopefully you sort of understood the value of, of simulation. So now let me kind of talk about the use cases, right? Using this kind of highly accurate hybrid digital twins, we have worked with customers in virtual commissioning, troubleshooting in sort of in a manufacturing setting. We have used it to do predictive maintenance, prescriptive maintenance. We have done production optimization, yield as a service in a true manufacturing setup. And we have have done that work actually in partnership with Rockwell Automation. So let me kind of talk about some of these customer use cases. I'm going to start with this manufacturing use case because this is a manufacturing center presentation, right? So in a large manufacturing setup, center uh, setup, you have a assembly line, right? Which will have different parts and many sort of different things like injection molding machines and lathes and and additive manufacturing machines and so on, right? So what we do is in working with Rockwell Automation. So this is a collaboration that we have done with them, right? We can do a, a so Rockwell has this uh, different software called Studio 5000 and, uh, and different software that can do a virtual sort of uh, uh, commissioning of the, the, the thing called Emulate 3D, where they will take a new plant and we have done it with a, uh, with a customer called Procter & Gamble. In their manufacturing plant, they essentially do a design of their plant using Emulate 3D. So that's the that ideal design, right? Then essentially we have worked with, with, with them. Each of those parts will do simulation of those different stages in the manufacturing plant. Then we'll do the design validation, the virtual commissioning, do all kinds of what if analysis. What if this machine goes down, that machine goes up? What's the sort of total throughput of this thing? What's the OEE of this uh, manufacturing plant and so on? Then once you've done that in the design part of that manufacturing plant, then you go to the operations maintenance phase and in that, our MCS Twin Builder is, is tied in with the Studio 5000 tool from Rockwell Automation and the ThingWorks tools from PTC and essentially build operational twin models of that virtue of, of the manufacturing plant. We have done these approaches with other uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of manufacturing processes, right? For glass and metals, for mining, for chemicals and food processing. And this is just showing you some examples of, of what we have done with this approach of hybrid digital twins, this partnership with Rockwell Automation. Then what we have done is we have worked with a company called Phoenix Contact. They manufacture all these, these contactors for, for, for designs and so on, right? The breakers and switches and so on. And the challenge was uh, unplanned downtime, right? Because of the failure of a relay, it can cost tens of thousands of dollars per hour. Very hard to predict the relay failure. And you actually cannot put a sensor inside that, that relay because it would completely change the matter of the delay. So using physics-based simulation, we are able to predict the component failure and essentially do uh, lower the, 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 
the unplanned downtime and save them thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Again, the details are shown here. I don't have time to go into the details. So that's Phoenix Contacts. We worked with Volkswagen Motorsports, right? There, this is a company, Volkswagen makes cars, right? So they were building a car for electric car to drive a car on a uh, peak, uh, a, a, a peak case, uh, a car race, right? And the car, the fastest car record was owned by, by a internal combustion engine car. Right? What we were able to do is to partner with Volkswagen in, in, in essentially breaking that racing record, right? In seven minutes, 57 seconds, this car was able to go into the Pikes Peaks race. And the way we did that is we, when you're building electric car, right? You have electric motor. So we are, we are able to model the electric motor. Then you have a, a, a battery in the system, right? So we are able to model the battery. And then the powertrain of how much torque is created by that battery system and so on. Now, obviously, if you want to build an electric car, right? You, you say, oh, I want to go fast. I will put a really large motor. To drive the really large motor, you need a large battery. If you do a large motor and a large battery, the weight of the car goes up, right? And so it is a very complicated system level trade off that you have to do. So we are able to do this trade off design, right, with Volkswagen and help them in the first round, right, to be able to build a car that beats this, this case. So that was a, a phenomenal uh, result that we are able to do with, 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 with Volkswagen. We have done work with uh, this Pro Procter & Gamble. I'm not mentioning this uh, custom here you know, on the slide, but it is Procter & Gamble. For this, we are able to work with in factory equipment for act Procter and Gamble for various applications that require very tight control of the quantity and flow of raw materials and 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 so and this is being actually implemented at the customer and this is partnership with Rockwell Automation. Then we have done a similar thing for compressors, a, a company called Kaiser Compressors, monetizing sort of comp compressor digital twins and accelerating product sales and so on. Uh, another example is that of Verbon Hydro. This is a company that makes uh, water turbines, right? And again, uh, you, you have lots and lots of these are large pieces of equipment, right? And if you can predict the wear on the turbine with different loading conditions, and that's the example of the what if scenario that I'm talking about that you can do with, with this simulation based digital twins. Turns out that we were able to save them sort of $100,000 per year per turbine, and they have hundreds of turbines in, the, in Verbon Hydro. NG is a company that is, is in the oil and gas area, right? And we are able to partner with them in that journey towards zero carbon energy in essentially doing the transition from this oil-based sort of energy to, to uh, zero carbon energy, right? Again, uh, partnering with them on different product uh, innovations and so on, doing predictive analytics. So as you can see, and again, this is another company that we have worked in the oil and gas industry called Total. So what this is showing is we have not only created a technology of the hybrid digital twin, which gets you to that accuracy from that 80% from data analytics to the 90% in simulation to the 98 to 99% in terms of technology, but we have actually been able to work with various companies, right? Inside Total or, or Procter & Gamble or NG or Volkswagen to show that this technology actually works. So I'll end my talk talking about the open ecosystem that we are uh, part of. And what I urge you is there is a consortium called Digital Twin Consortium that, again, there are more than 200 members. ANSYS is one of eight founding members. So along with GE, with Autodesk, Bentley, uh, Microsoft, and so on. So when you are building this digital twin, right, you need to do things at the edge level. So in terms of edge company, Dell was the partner, right? In terms of cloud company, Microsoft is a partner. You need a CAD company, so therefore Autodesk is a partner. You need a simulation company, so Bentley and, and ANSYS are partners. So it's this is how they kind of build the whole thing. And G representing the sort of aircraft and so on, manufacturing and same thing with, with North Ground. It's a very, very exciting area. They're essentially creating different uh, models, types of digital twin definition language. And we are collaborating with Microsoft and this DTDL technology to help build hybrid digital twins. And they're applying this in different verticals like manufacturing, defense, aerospace. Again, for universities, the, the sort of the fee is free, right? And we don't have to pay any, any, any fees. So I urge you, uh, Professor Powell, to join the Digital Dream Consortium. I'm happy to make the introductions. And then again, if you got excited about what I've shared, you can go to our ANSYS uh, Digital Dream website and, and see a lot of uh, information. 
So, and so I urge you to go to ansys.com slash digital twin and all the technology that I talked to you about, various seminars and webinars and customer use cases, you can see that. So I am at the end of my talk. So I was, I was watching the time I was able to do this so I can answer any questions. Uh, so digital twins, as I showed, is an accelerating trend in industry. It is a $26 billion market. It's applicable in different industries like aerospace, automotive, manufacturing, oil and gas buildings and so on. It's a very, very exciting area, but the problems are the most of the industry is using this data analytics based approach, right? And as I showed you that the accuracy is not high enough and therefore you need physics based simulation, but pure physics based simulation gets you from the 80% to the 90% accuracy. If you can combine physics and data analytics, as we have shown you in this presentation, right? It leads to that 98%, 99% uh, accuracy. We are able to show these things with various customer use cases with, as I said, with Procter & Gamble, with Rockwell, with Verbon and Total and, and NG, and then sort of the open ecosystem that we have done, right? No one company can do it alone, right? We are providing the simulation solution. We are working with Autodesk on the CAD solution. We are working with Microsoft on the cloud. We are working with Dell on the edge. We are working with different partners, right? And that's what it requires. And so uh, organizations like the Digital Twin Consortium are leading that edge. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for your wonderful, you know, the talk. I'm really amazed to see the uh, excellent examples, use cases in various fields of manufacturing. You have rightly told the, the hybrid digital twin is the ultimate solution for, uh, you know, the in the field of manufacturing, the data driven model, as you have correctly pointed out, it doesn't give you the uh, very high accuracy. You have talked about the how to convert the 3D model to, to the model through the your reduced order modeling concept where you have clubbed the reduced order model along with the data driven model to you know the apply it in the actual the manufacturing in this case. You have mentioned about the accuracy it has increased uh, from 80% to 98% which is uh, really amazing. Can you please give us some you know the uh, the idea about the real time applications like uh, you know if I add the simulation model even though it's a reduced order simulation model along with the data model. So what would be the comp computational complexity even if we, if we you know they go for the uh, high computing facility and all but how much is the computational time increase? Okay. Can you give us some idea for one or two cases of the man? You know, the sure. Cases? So as I said, the digital twin, when you define the digital twin, the digital twin has to be synchronized with the real asset, right? So essentially, if you, it's like weather forecasting, right? If you do very accurate weather forecasting, right? And you need tomorrow's weather, right? You need to get that simulation within 24 hours. If it takes you 10 days to get the weather forecasting, it's no good, right? So the key thing is to get it in that timeline, right? So which is why I, I, I started with the definition of a digital twin, which is a model which is synchronized with the asset at a specified accuracy or fidelity and frequency. That is the core, right? So you could get very accurate digital twin models with 3D simulation, but that would take a long time. So that would be impractical, which is why we did the reduced order models. So just to give you some, some uh, ideas of time for a really complicated uh, asset, a full 3D model would take about a hundred hours or a thousand hours to run. That same model, but that would be super accurate. I mean, it will tell you this pressure temperature is, is this much, right? With reduced order model, this sort of static ROMs, dynamic ROMs and so on, that time would go down to a matter of seconds. Instead of 10,000 hours, would run in seconds. It's that fast, but it does it with accuracy. Only thing is it, it is parameterized, right? So it is not looking at all the 10 million unknowns, right? It is looking at certain unknowns, right? For, so it is a approximation of whatever it is that you're trying to predict. So if you're trying to predict a particular noise here or there or so on, so it is a reduced order model. The order goes down from this million unknowns to two or three, which is how you can make it that accurate, right? And, and that's where this whole technology of 
static ROMs and dynamic ROMs come, but the time goes from a thousand hours to a matter of seconds. This model is what we create as this twin, which we deploy in terms of a one zero sort of software code that runs on the edge device. It could be ARM processor or something. But just that by itself would, because we are doing this ROM technology or losing in the accuracy, then what you do is you connect that with the actual real time, right? So you may start with a valve or a compressor, which is sort of as designed, right? You have the original uh, sort of uh, equations of the valve or, or whatever, right? Idealistic model. But after 20 years, that valve or compressor no longer works as the real thing, right? So you constantly model, you, you're, you're collecting data of that, of that pump or compressor, and you make it, you calibrate it, you try to make the ROM model to be like this, and it's that combination of data analytics and so on which makes it really accurate. That's how we get to the 98%. It's excellent because, uh, you know, the we are also doing a little bit of work on the hybrid digital twin for our friction star welding process. And where the, uh, you know, the all material model and everything, we are trying to club with the data that we are capturing through the sensors. But we are facing difficulty regarding the real-time clubbing of the simulation data along with the sensors data. Now I think of the wrong, you know, reduced order model and look into that aspect and then see that how we can take it forward. But it's a wonderful, you know, the uh, uh, opportunity for us to join the Digital Twin Consortium. I really, I'll be more than happy, you know. So I will actually introduce you to Richard Soli, who is my personal friend. So I, after this thing to, to, on Monday, I'll send an introduction and you can join. Again, it is free. And, yeah. and Richard knows that I'm an IIT Kharagpur alum, so he will absolutely, be, because there's a great way for and many universities are part of it. And, and in this way yeah. you'll be absolutely on top of, of what is going on. I'm watching the chats here, so let me try to answer some of the questions here. So, yeah, yeah, Subir yeah. Mazumdar says, coming from airplane engines background, I wonder how to simulate characteristics of new materials. That's a great idea, right? So, basically, the question is how to simulate characteristics of new materials like ceramics and composites, etc., where their properties and failure are not yet established. So, great question. And I mentioned, so as part of the uh, uh, of my sort of technology office, city office, right? I have these 12 pillars. One of the pillars is this thing called ICME, Integrated Computer Materials Engineering, which is what I think you are mentioning, right? So we have acquired a technology, a company called Granta, which has access, which provides us access to different materials properties, but it's just like a, a database model, right? What we are now doing is partnering with companies in the computational chemistry area, like, like Schrodinger and CCG, computer, Chemical Co Computing Group, right? Where we are looking at atoms and molecules, right? And essentially extrapolating what should be the material properties of this. What is the Young's modulus of steel? You combine that with sort of 40% steel and 70%, uh, 60% aluminum, right? That particular alloy, what characteristic will that have? So we are going back to basics, to ICME to get to those properties. Once you have the properties, you're using that to, to program the ANSYS mechanical. And once you have that doing the ROMs, so it's that multi-scale modeling that I talked about, right? Which is the whole vision of ICME. That's how we uh, uh, are approaching that appro uh, problem. Another question, reduced order models, are they in real time? Yes, they are, right? So essentially real time <laughs> is, a, is a definition, right? So the key thing is that in the definition of digital twin, it is a model of, it's a virtual model of a real world asset, which is synchronized at whatever. So if you are getting data once a second, then you have to run it in a second. If you are getting a, a, a data once every millisecond, then you will synchronize it to millisecond. If you're getting once an hour, you have to synchronize to an hour. So the definition of real time is dependent on how frequently you are getting data from the sensors, right, from the asset, right? If it's a power smart meter, then you're getting data every 15 minutes, right? So the definition of real time, it depends on your application. And the way we do the reduced order models, we tune it, right, because it's like a sliding bar. We tune it so that we get the output at that frequency. That's how we are, we are doing this real time, okay. Where ML model can be used in creation? Oh, that is a great question. So there's Mohammed Parwell, right? He's saying where machine learning can be used. So I'll give you a very short answer. In simulation, there's all kinds of patterns and structures and so on that is going on, right? 
So there are these things called data-driven neural networks that people have used. There is some work done by George Konarikis at Brown University on physics in for neural networks, which says, hey, if you know the physics, you can constrain the physics to Navier-Stokes equation and thereby not have as much uh, sort of uh, training data and so on. But what we have done at ANSYS is to come up with this ML-based PDE solvers. That's a sort of a second, a different talk that I can go give. But essentially, it's a, those other approaches are data-driven. They're, they can solve it for a particular use case, but they're not generalizable. What we have done is a really general approach to doing ML-based methods for general partial differential equations. And we have applied to Fluent and so on, and we have been able to get speed ups about 100 times using ML, ML methods. Unfortunately, I have to keep it at that because I need to go to the other questions. Uh, thanks, Dr. Banerjee, for a deep focus on processes, etc. IT Kharagpur has been. Can you tell us how tools like you want to reduce can be used for process modeling? So, first of all, one thing that I've already talked to Professor uh, Paul is that, I mean, I, I would like, as part of sort of, again, I, I, I mean, IIT Kharagpur has been really good to me. I was able to give a little back, as you know, Dr. Professor Paul, with the, in our chair in, in EC. I would like to give back our simulation tools to IIT Kharagpur, right, for all students and faculty use. So you just tell me what you what tools you need and we'll make all our tools available at your center at IIT Kharagpur. I want to make sure all your students are being exposed to these different tools, right, for mechanical tools, for fluids tools, fluent, uh, uh, HFSS, what, and digital twins. So please reach out to me. Uh, predict data of different failure modes with simulation models. How do you induce those faults in the CAD model? Ah, great question, right? So it is those. So the question is from Kamlesh, right? To predict data for different failure modes, how do we induce those faults? So remember in that one slide I said, doing this what if scenarios, right? So essentially in the CAD, we, we, we have a technology called geometry modeling called space claim. So in that, we can actually change the models and say, okay, let me model a fact that this contact does not become a contact. So when that contact disengages, we can now do a simulation of what the impact of that will be. Or when, when you, through our Red Hawk SC, right, we can model actual circuit simulations and so on. We can model the fact that this particular metal thing, that bonding has broken up. So we are able to do that by interacting with the CAD using the tool that we have called space claim. Uh, I've tried to answer most of the questions. Are there any other questions? Thank you for asking the question on the chat sign. I, I don't know if, if there's other questions coming or not. I think I have answered most of them. Well, thank you so much, Professor Paul. I, I know you are at the top of the hour. You may wish to wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Banerjee, for your wonderful talk. I think the students have really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. So we'll get back to you uh, regarding the, the joining in the, you know, the digital twin consortia and all. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really, it was a wonderful Saturday morning start to me. Thank you. Take care. So I request Ananta to let us know the, the next three speaker details. Ananta, could you please do that? Yes, sir. So Dr. Vanity, small appreciation from our center of excellence. Thank you very much. So the upcoming webinars in, the, in this month is uh, next speaker, Professor Keshav Das from University of Illinois, Arvanda Santan. Professor Das will be talking about the decision and control system. So thank you friends for your uh, presence and I look forward to your, see you in the next Saturday, the same time, 8.30 p.m. in the Indian Center time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brandt.